Hello and welcome to the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. Each episode will bring you the latest news from the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, as well as fascinating interviews with entertainment personalities, government leaders, and community advocates. St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, where Scotland meets the City of Angels. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to another great episode of the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles. Our guest today is David McPherson. David is the creator and lead writer for the upcoming Amazon Prime show, The Rig, starring Ian Glenn and Martin Comston. David grew up in the Highlands of Scotland. He left for the big city to study history and philosophy at Glasgow University. Later in life, David began writing and immediately thereafter, his career blossomed as he was shortlisted for the Red Planet Prize and was also given the Edinburgh TV Festival New Voices Award. In 2018, David sold his first script, which was later selected by Britlist for Best Unproduced TV Pilot in the UK. In August of 2020, Amazon Studios gave the green light to David's original sci-fi thriller, The Rig a six-part series which will be the first of Amazon's UK originals and is being filmed exclusively in Scotland at the newly opened First Stage studio. First Stage is being led by Bob Last and Jason Connery and is Scotland's first huge movie studio. David also has projects in development with several well-known entertainment names, including the BBC, Wild Mercury Productions, and Balloon Entertainment, just to name a few. We are so very happy to have this talented writer and creator on our show. Please welcome David McPherson. Today, our guest host and moderator is Julia Wackenheim. Julia is a Los Angeles-based actor, producer, and writer. She can be seen in her web series, Eft, as well as in television commercials and on stage. Julia advocates for social justice, is a mother of an extraordinary six-year-old, and is married to TV producer and writer Scott Gimple. David, welcome to the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. Fantastic. Exciting. You have had you have this really amazing story. It's like a Hollywood magical story where your first your first script has gotten picked up and being made into a show or one of your first scripts is being made into a show. And I think every, I would love to know what was the catalyst that started your writing career and lead, led you on your path now to where you are. Yeah, that's a good question. So it is, I do still have to pinch myself a lot, particularly when I, I'm walking around the set, we built this gigantic set of an oil rig and I still keep thinking, are they really going to let me do this? Uh, and it seems they are, so I'm just going with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I I wanted to be a writer for a long, long time. At first, I was a big reader as a child. You know, I, I grew up in uh, the far north of Scotland, in the Highlands, in a small kind of farming community called Ardross. Uh, I wouldn't even say it's a village. It's just a collection of farms. And uh, it was one of those places where you kind of had the choice as a kid. You were either very, very outdoorsy or you stayed inside and watched a lot of TV and read a lot of books. And I did the latter. Uh, I still went outside a little bit, but mainly, yeah, reading a lot, watching a lot of, uh, on TV. And just uh, I've always just had a, a great passion for escaping into other worlds and, and sort of learning through literature about uh, the way other people live and great stories, brilliant storytelling. Uh, but my path to actually becoming a professional writer, it took quite a long time because I think like a lot of Scottish people, uh, like, well, even London seemed like a very, very long way away from where I grew up. And Hollywood certainly seems uh, like a, a different planet sometimes. Uh, so the idea that I could actually do that and become a, a television writer that came to me quite late and was sort of a various stages. Uh, so first, I, after school, I went to university, uh, studied history and philosophy in Glasgow. Uh, and for me, Glasgow was the big city. Uh, and then after that, 
I worked in politics for a while. I worked for my local member of parliament up in the Highlands. Uh, and then I spent some time down in London working in the House of Lords in the UK parliament, uh, which was a brilliant experience to see and sort of be in the the kind of the heart of government. Although I must say my role was very, very small, but I got to see lots of stuff, uh, which was great. After working in London and Parliament, I decided I wanted to go back to Scotland. So I, I moved back north. I set myself the challenge of writing one spec strip a year, every year, and then starting sending it out. And um, the first couple of those, I got some interest from some contests. Never actually won a contest, still never won a contest. Uh, but it managed to get me noticed by some production companies. One of them optioned my first script, Wrath, which was a brilliant moment. And that really, that opened the doors then. Uh, and then the rig actually was one of the, it was one of the first uh, general meetings that I took uh, when I did my first kind of round of general meetings in London, meeting all the production companies. Uh, I went to Wild Mercury, our producers, with this idea about doing a show based on an oil rig off the coast of uh, Scotland. Uh, uh, and they really, really loved it. And it all came together uh, from there. Uh, they, they commissioned a pilot script. Uh, and after we did that, Amazon were one of the first people that we went to and they really loved it. So they commissioned a second episode script. And then on the basis of the second episode, uh, this took, about a year or so, a year and a half. Uh, it was last last August. They gave us the green light to make the show. And uh, in another thing that uh, I, I don't know, sometimes it's it's been like all the things that you get told won't happen as a young screenwriter, <laughs> and they're all turning out. And the strangest one I think of all is that the studio where we're filming the show is about ten minutes from my flat, uh, so I'm able just to be there the whole time and not just write the show but watch everything get made and be in the heart of the production which is very exciting. I got a quick question for you because your story is so interesting especially you know you just go and get a book from the bookstore and you're like okay I'm gonna make this happen and you <laughs> such an ambitious project to, to write a, a feature off the bat did you find that there was a lot of freedom in that because you hadn't had the formal training and you just kind of we're winging it almost, you know, reading a book and like, okay, I can do this and, and going for it and doing it. Did you find that that gave you a lot more freedom? Because It meant that I didn't have to follow anyone else's structure. You know, I think uh, traditionally, I guess, many people would start with shorts uh, and, and sort of move on from there. But uh, I really wanted to make film and TV. And so I, in my naivety, I think, I think naivety is a great asset sometimes. Uh, I just thought, well, I'll, I'll give it a go and I'll see how I get on. Uh, and it was a lot of practice and then a lot of reading other people's scripts as well. And it was a great thing for any screenwriter to do, read as many as possible and sort of find the things that you love. And, and if you can do it, read the script along with watching it. That was a great exercise I did a lot uh, to sort of see the difference between how things are translated. Um, and I also, I, I followed the advice of uh, Charlie Brooker, created Black, Black Mirror, I remember him saying once on an interview that when when you're doing it for yourself, when you're doing it on spec, uh, that's the one time where you don't have to worry about the budget, you don't have to worry about you know the audience or how it will fit on a broadcast or anything like that. You can just do the thing that you most want to see. Uh, and so that is, that's kind of been the thing that I've tried to do, uh, just to do the, the things that I really, really want to see. Uh, and yeah, it's worked out pretty well, I think. Um, do you have any um, any any literary heroes or TV shows or favorite films or anything that have inspired you or, or really resonated with you that have informed your work? Uh, yeah, lots and lots. Uh, I think uh, on on the film side, I have my two favorite films, which are kind of it's, it's, it's a bit of a uh, A to Z. It's uh, the Princess Bride by William Goldman. I think it's just one of the most fun, brilliant stories uh, ever put on film. And I just like, I probably watched that about 150 times. And it's one of those, you know, 
I could do the whole thing if I really needed to. Uh, and that's at one end. And then my other favourite film is uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. So we go from romance and fairy tale to cosmic sci-fi horror. Uh, and I think everything in between uh, I really love. So, And then on the TV side, I, I have to say, although I'm here in the UK, I've always looked to uh, a lot to US TV. Firstly, when I was growing up, I'm a huge sci-fi nerd. So Star Trek, uh, Star Wars, Stargate, all the stars. Uh, I was a big, big fan of, particularly Star Trek. Um, and then latterly, you know, the really big landmark shows like The Sopranos, uh, The West Wing. Uh, it was my girlfriend who got me into The West Wing. And I'm very, very grateful because I love that show. Uh, and, and one of my huge influences that I really, uh, I still think it's one of the best uh, achievements in TV is the Fargo TV show. The way that Noah Hawley was able to take that, you know, near perfect Coen Brothers film and manage to make something that is so, it has, it's a completely different story, but it is so utterly off a piece with the film and that he's managed to do that now. Uh, four times. I just started the four series last night. We had to wait a little bit to get it over here. Um, but that he's managed to do that, I think. And it really charts, it seems to chart the, the development of the US over the last sort of 50 years, 60 years. I think that's a great achievement. Uh, I think. And then UK shows, a really big show for me in my development was over in the UK was uh, Dennis Kelly's Utopia. Uh, it's kind of conspiracy, a conspiracy out a graphic novel, but uh, it was just, it came at a time in my life where I, I felt a lot of UK shows, we had seemed to have fallen into uh, what I would perhaps describe shows as very, 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 very serious people talking in poorly lit rooms. Uh, and when Utopia came along, uh, and I shouldn't be too flippant. There was a lot of great drama made in, in the UK, but but when Utopia came along, even just the colour palette of that show was revolutionary. It was so bright. It was such a good mix of comedy and drama, very, very heavy, dark themes, but done with a brilliant lightness of touch that I felt was a very US sensibility, but with a very UK twist on it. And uh, I think that's a brilliant show. I love all of these shows that you're talking about. I'm so excited that you have such a spectrum of influences here. And, and it, it's so great. Um, so The Rig takes, takes us off of Scotland's Northwest Coast and is a sci-fi thriller. So what stories have you heard from like your father that first intrigued you? And was there a story in particular that spurred your imagination to kind of go this direction? Uh, so oil rigs and the, the oil industry, thats it's kind of been a part of my life since I was a child. So where I grew up uh, on the Cromarty Firth, that's where they used to build oil rigs. Uh, and my dad, that was my dad's job when I was growing up. He worked in the, the kind of shipyard there building rigs. And then when we were a bit older, uh, me and my brother and sister, then he started to work offshore on the rigs in the North Sea. And so... Oil rigs have sort of both uh, literally and metaphorically kind of towered over my childhood. They used to repair them uh, in a harbour just near where I went to school. So they, you could literally see them towering over the, the town. And so I'd always wanted to do a story based on that because my dad would bring back all these stories, uh, you know, sometimes of the, the dangerous stuff that happens there. He was a, he went on to be a, a crane safety engineer and mechanic. So one of the things he used to have to do is uh, walk to the end of the crane. Uh, so you're you're about a hundred feet off the sea. Uh, sometimes the rig is moving in, in the water, and you have to walk to the end of the boom of the crane and check all the machinery there. And you know you have a harness on, but still, it's uh, I wouldn't want to do it. Definitely not. Uh, uh, and so he used to come back with those stories, but as well, it was it was the mystery of it too. Right? Uh, oil workers here, uh, it's probably the same in the US, they, they do these rotations where he would be away for two weeks 
at a time or three weeks sometimes and then home for the same amount of time. But when he was away, you know, you just never really knew what, what was happening there. Sometimes me and my brother, we used to joke that maybe he was a spy because it would literally just be, he goes to the airport you don't see him for two weeks, you know, you hear him on the phone, but he could be anywhere, it's, you know, you don't really know that he's on the oil rig. Uh, so that was a joke that we used to have. And then later on, he used to, he used to come back with all, all kinds of strange stories about what the guys get up to over there and, you know, the, the strange things that happen, like they, they would quite often get stuck in fog and that means the helicopter can't fly out to get them. So then you're just, you're trapped there and you don't know how long it's going to be. Uh, and the great thing about those places is they kind of, they have all sectors of society there. So you've got, you know, you've got the management of the rig, you know, tend to be uh, people who've gone to university and things like that. You've got the, the oil company representatives. Then you've got the the guys on the, on the rig floor who are doing a lot of the outdoor work and the, the engineering and the mechanical and electrical stuff. But then you've also got, you've got the cooks, you've got the... The stewards who look after everything you've got every kind of sector is represented so it's kind of like a tiny little town it has uh, and so it's a great great place for drama because you've got so many different tension points uh, uh, i thought it was just a great place to to set a drama and and mainly it was because no one else had done it i was like why has no one else done this now that we're in production i can kind of understand why no one else has done it <laughs> <laughs> but again that's the power of naivety i think what um what has it been like on set um have there been any really exciting moments that you've had or yeah it's been it's been brilliant we have such a lovely cast and crew and that's what everyone keeps saying to me that it's such a, a sort of nice set to be on i think because we're we're generally in the studio for almost the whole production so we've really had a chance to make it our home essentially um but in terms of sort of really exciting points well the first really exciting one came just before production started we went on a location scout to an actual oil rig so me and the director john strickland we flew to the orkney islands in the very north and there was a rig there in scapa flow and it was being repaired so we managed to get a boat out to it and arriving at the bottom of the rig on a boat in the early morning and you kind of, you know, I'd seen them, but I'd never been on one before. I'd never been that close. And just the huge scale of these machines uh, was incredible. And then we had to we had to walk up 70 feet of stairs uh, on the outside of the rig just to get to the main deck. So then we're 70 feet above the ocean and John Strickland turned to me and he said, uh, just remember, David, uh, we're all here because of you. <laughs> it's all your fault. Uh, so that was a great moment. Uh, and he reminds me of that quite a lot. Uh, but in terms of on the set, I think one of the really great days uh, early on in filming, uh, we have a brilliant scene uh, on the heli deck, and it's one of our first big group scenes. It's at night. And it's, it was one of the days where, uh, one of the first days where all the cast were there together. We had everyone there and just seeing that scene play out. It's a great face off between Ian Glenn uh, and Owen Teal, two actors that I really love and still can't quite believe that I get to write lines for them. Uh, but seeing the two of them sort of face off against each other on our set, uh, that was a brilliant day, really exciting. Is there anything that um, has kind of surprised you about the process of, of working on TV that perhaps you hadn't thought about before or hadn't experienced before? Uh, I think everything still surprises me. <laughs> uh, and part of it, I think probably one thing in particular is is the speed of things. So both both in terms of how fast things can be. So we had an example where I can give you uh I'll try not to do any spoilers, but but there was a we had one of our characters has a, a sort of a deep grief in their past that they they lost their son uh, in an accident uh, a few years ago, and originally we had been planning to uh, 
to do this uh, all through people talking about it there and, and you know, he's got his family photos and things. But one morning I was chatting with the director and we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if in one scene he was able to see his son? Uh, because because as the sci-fi element cranks up, we start to play with people's memories and, and seeing things. So we thought that would be a great idea. But I just sort of, I offered it in the meeting as, a, as an idea. Two hours later, I got sent a uh, selection of uh, young actors that they thought could play the son. And then two hours after that, we had cast them and they were coming in the next day to... Uh, to do the sort of uh, the background shots and stuff, so that was a bit of a head spinning a moment. I was sort of like, "Oh, I need to be careful about what I say here because they're actually going to do it." Um, and then on the other side, in terms of the other side of speed, is that it's strange to think that. So I started these scripts. Uh, it would have been December or yeah, December twenty eighteen, January twenty nineteen, and so. You know, a couple of years now they've been in process, but even until the very last moment, we're still tweaking things and we're still changing things, even in the very opening scene, which we did, we're doing out of sequence. So we did the opening scene last week. Um, and even then we were sort of uh, changing lines and tweaking lines and just making sure that it was as good as it can be. So that kind of breadth of stuff, that's been surprising, but lots of fun as well. How has it been um, working with folks tweaking your work? Do, do you have like a possessiveness about it or, or are you pretty easy breezy about it? I, I I like to think I'm pretty easy breezy about it. I, I certainly, I went into it with the attitude of being open to talking about all these things. I'm not a kind of writer who's like, it must be this way. You know, you even have to pronounce the commas. Uh, <laughs> nothing like that. Um, and I think what's been really great working with that the cast that we have and the actors are of such uh, great caliber is that there's no ego involved in our show. You know, when people come to me with ideas for changing lines or changing scenes, uh, when the actors and you know not just the actors but uh, John or or anyone really, it's always done with the intention of making the show better, and I can really sense that and. Uh, many times, uh, yeah, people have better ideas than me, and I'm very happy to to steal those from them and pretend that it was me all along, <laughs> and take all the credit for it in the end. Uh, yeah, and and work with people to just to make sure that we're doing the best show that we can do. Uh, and I mean, it's been great. Uh, I think having Ian Glenn uh, sort of leading the cast. He sets a wonderful tone on set, sort of professionalism, and but also, you know, just a lightness of touch and yeah, no egos, uh, all very supportive, and and everyone's just working their hardest to make it all the best it can be. What is your writing situation like? Do you have a certain spot or a certain time of day or a routine that you like to or that you do um, in order to be able to focus on writing? Uh, I I aspire to have a routine. I think that's what I would say. I, on a good week, I can I can get into it quite well. But uh, you know, I, I generally write at home in in my. I've got a small desk, a tiny little desk wedged in the corner of my spare room. Uh, that's not one day I will get a bigger desk. That would be lovely. Um, but yeah, most of my writing I do there. Since we've been shooting, I'm able to go to the studio, so I was able to to write from there a lot. But uh, in terms of discipline, one one great thing that I managed to get in the habit of is uh, when I'm doing first drafts now, I like to do them quickly. Um, I did a brilliant course through the National Film and TV School we have here, uh, which was a writing a TV pilot course. This was before I sold anything. I got things picked up. And the challenge of that course was the whole point of it was you were there for two weeks and you would write a pilot in those two weeks. Uh, you had to come with an idea ready to go and do that. And before that, you know, the previous pilot I wrote to that, that took me about a year. And so going in, I was like, no way, no way can you write a pilot in two weeks. But it was such a great course. We managed to do it. 
uh, I managed to do mine. And now, now that I sort of proved myself and I can do that, that's how I write all my first drafts. Uh, I try and do, when I'm in that mode, I try and do uh, five pages a day, at least, uh, for a first draft. You know, lots of prep before that. But when it gets to the actual script itself, that's the kind of target I set myself. Uh, and most of the most of the time, I achieve it. Yeah. Uh, hypothetical situation: um, if you had to uh, choose what your next project would be, but you had to choose one of these: either a romantic comedy, a western, or a musical. Which would you choose to write if you had to? Like you had no other. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think it probably wouldn't be a musical because I'm one of the least musical people uh, ever. I, strangely, I when I was uh, before I started on on this oil rig project, I, I went in. I was suggested, and I don't know. I don't understand why they chose me, but someone put me forward for writing a show about a nightclub. Uh, and about dance music, and uh, I am the least likely person to not even write a show about a nightclub, but to go to a nightclub. Uh, like when I go to a party, my partner always has to tell me, "Like you're not allowed to bring a book to the party, David." Uh, that is not um, uh, and I think that's what I would do in a nightclub as well. So probably not a musical. Uh, I, I kind of feel like I, I want to say western. But romantic comedy is quite, you know, I like a good romantic comedy, particularly like, uh, you know, Nora Ephron's uh, Greek comedies. I'm a big fan of hers. So I think that would be a really interesting challenge. Uh, but I do also like Westerns. Uh, um, and I think one of the things I think uh, that ties kind of where I grew up in the Highlands and uh, a lot of the kind of, the, with the US experience as well is that in many ways the Highlands feels like a bit of a frontier it's a sort of a wild remote place in the same way that the Wild West uh, is often portrayed as or you know even in modern westerns as well things like Hell or High Water or uh, uh, that kind of forgotten place or, or sort of uh, remote place where people just have to People just have to get on with things themselves. You know, there's no, there's no, uh, the police aren't coming to help you if you get into trouble and uh, uh, you're kind of a law unto yourself. So that kind of side of things really attracts me. Um, so maybe I would do a Western, but maybe it would be set in Scotland. I can see that. I'd watch that. Yeah, I would definitely watch that movie. <laughs> Um, you mentioned earlier about, uh, well, and, and so did Juana about your bio, about how you had all these completely different careers in, in completely different fields. And I was really curious to know a little bit more about your time working in politics. Um, you know, as an American, we have a very, very volatile uh uh, rife with crazy stories, uh, politics, but I think things are also very um, exciting and interesting in UK politics. So I was wondering, um, you know, can you speak a little bit about your experience working and, and did you come up with any thoughts or ideas for future projects, perhaps within that, um, that, that realm of politics? Yeah, yeah, I can. I think it, it was a very exciting time. Uh, I think the great thing about uh, I probably wouldn't have said this at the time, but the great thing about having had a lot of short careers, uh, the great thing about it as a writer is that I now have a lot to draw on. You know, most of the projects that I had picked up, uh, they tend to have some kind of personal connection to something I've done in the past. And so that's been really useful, um, whether it's work or or personal life as well. But I think having that long lead-in time to to sort of breaking through as a writer is actually not necessarily a bad thing. You know, then you've got a lot of ammo, you've got a lot of life experience to use. <laughs> Working in politics was great for that because it's such, particularly the UK parliament system is in many ways so weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Did you have to wear a wig? I'm kidding. I, I didn't have to wear a wig, but my boss had to wear a wig sometimes. And he had to wear these very, on, on formal occasions, he had to wear these very tight trousers, which he always used to complain about. Uh, and these kind of red, like on the state opening of Parliament, he had to wear these red, uh, these red and gold trousers, which uh, he was a big gruff Yorkshireman and uh, he was not impressed with the trousers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think, you know, the UK Parliament itself is such a, a strange place and so steeped in tradition. Um, that's one of the things that I was fascinated about it, as well as the political side, just the history of the place, that that part of that building, Westminster Hall, is almost a thousand years old. It was built by the son of William the Conqueror uh, in the 11th century, and it's been there ever since. And uh, just the history in that building, it's where, for instance, it's where William Wallace was put on trial. It's where Charles I was put on trial. They actually have, they have in the building Charles I's death warrant uh, signed by Oliver Cromwell. And I don't know if this is kind of a, uh, a a sort of subtle warning, but it, it's on display in a room called the Royal Gallery, which is on the state opening of Parliament. Uh, the monarch has to walk through that room to get to the throne. So it's it's a little bit of a you know just remember we're a, a monarchy but a parliamentary monarchy, uh, right. and so that was great. But yeah, so I used to have to walk through Westminster Hall every morning to to get into work. That was a uh, fantastic experience and uh, I worked in the House of Lords as well which is uh, it's our second chamber a bit it's a bit like the Senate but uh, in our strange uh, British way it's unelected it's one of the only unelected <laughs> chambers in the world you get chosen to sit in the House of Lords by the Prime Minister or there are actually still about 90 hereditary aristocrats who managed to hang on to their seats. Um, and so it's a very, it's a kind of strange environment because uh, it's less seen uh, even in the UK. A lot of people don't really know what the House of Lords does. Um, but the breadth of experience of the people who are there uh, is incredible. And then I sort of, I used to think that we should probably do away with it. It's not very democratic. Uh, there's always lots of talk of reforming the Lords, but having worked there now, I can, I'm not totally convinced, but I can see a little bit more about the value of, it, of sort of people who can take a very long-term view of certain situations. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting place to explore for drama. And the other great thing about it is because we do do a lot of politics shows in Britain, uh, but I think what we miss is that our politics shows are always very cynical. Uh, the the it's always tends to be about how uh, politicians are all in it for themselves, or or their stories about you know the politicians actually a murderer, or he's a criminal, or he's having an affair. It's never particularly about the issues themselves, and that's why. It's, that's why I really liked the West Wing. It had that great, that great balance of being uh, a fun show, a serious show, but also a very hopeful show in the sense of what what civics, good civic responsibility and, and politics can be. And that's something that I saw represented when I worked there. You know, there are so many people who work so so hard. Uh, and never really get any credit and, uh, you know, devote their lives to public service. But that's never really shown in how politics is portrayed on TV or here. Uh, we, we like to make fun of our politicians much, much more, uh, which I've got a lot of time for as well. I'm a big Armando Annucci fan, for instance. And, you know, it's good to, to uh, mock the people in power as well. But I think there's space for both. So... I'd really like to do a show which is a kind of a British West Wing. And one of the ideas I had about that was uh, the other thing about uh, the UK Parliament, although not, not in the House of Lords, but it's a, actually a very young place. Other than the, the MPs themselves, most of the staff 
uh, are sort of in their 20s. And uh, that's another thing that doesn't really get represented on our versions. It's always uh, old white guys with grey hair. Uh, and that wasn't really the politics that I saw. And so I wanted to do a show about uh, hopeful young people that work really hard and care about big issues because they're important and uh, have a lot of fun along the way. But also we get to explore all the weird things about the UK Parliament as well. That juxtaposition of youth and enthusiasm with strange traditions. Like uh, there's another one, there's, there's a place called the Star, I think it's called the Star Chamber. Uh, it's at the back of the House of Lords. And while Parliament is sitting, if you're not an uh, MP or a Lord, you're not allowed to stand on the carpet. You, you have to stand on the edge of the room. And I used to have to go up here to, because that's how you get messages to people in the chamber or it was before everyone was just texting each other. Uh, you have to sort of stand at the edge of the carpet and hope that you can catch someone's attention and that they can go and get the person that you need uh, and all this yeah, weird, weird place. Fascinating. Um, is, there a, is there a passion project, and perhaps it's the one you, you just spoke about, um, that you're working on or would like to see made? Yes, yeah, so, so Wrath is one that I really, really want to do. Uh, um one day it's a it's a great uh it's a story about up set around cape wrath uh, in the very northwest corner of scotland one of the most remote parts um and it's a sort of fargo-esque story about the woman who drives the mobile bank which is uh oh, wow. you probably don't have them over there uh, so in very out of the way places it's essentially a large van with an office in the back and an ATM on the side and it goes around all the small villages and that's how people do their banking if there's no branch nearby huh. uh, and it's sort of they put it on a ferry and it goes out to the islands and uh, it was it used to be in this very famous this is where the idea came from it used to be in this very famous advert over here where you would see it cross this lock on a little ferry very picturesque is that it's out in the middle of the water uh, with only the driver and the ferryman. Uh, and whenever I saw that advert, I was like, someone should rob that bank. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a van full of cash driving around. Uh, so uh, that's a show that I really want to do. It, it becomes a much more a kind of a Robin Hood story. She, she winds up with a lot of uh, a drug dealer's cash. And rather than keep it for herself, she decides to try and give it away to worthy causes which goes well for about one episode and then the drug dealers come looking for their money back uh, so that that's a show I really want to do and then I've actually got a uh, a US based show that we're we're just about ready to start pitching hopefully uh, once I'm kind of freed up from time from the rig uh, that's one that I really want to get uh, going and it's, it's interesting Julia that you're saying uh a uh, social activist because it's a show all about activism uh, and it's set in uh, at Berkeley University in the 60s uh, with a very particular and uh, unique activist group there uh, and really it's a story what I want to get into in that story uh, and our team it's about what does it mean to be an activist uh, and what does it cost to be an activist uh, I always think when I think of the really big activist people like uh, Martin Luther King and, uh, and uh, you know Gandhi and uh, uh, well any of it, you know lots and lots of big social activists the suffragettes as well over here and and also just people who dedicate themselves to trying to make things better uh, I always think you know at what point do you decide you've done enough? You know, when when have you given enough of your life to this cause? And I think everyone has to have a different view on that. But that area, I think, for me, is really interesting, seeing in a different group of people all very passionate about one cause. But at what point do people sort of say, uh, you know, you know, now I want to go and start a family or, uh, you know, I want to keep fighting or... And how do you bridge those those kind of very real pressures? So that's a project that I'm 
uh, really excited about and and hopefully we can yeah once we start pitching it we'll we'll get a lot of interest because I, I think it's a very I can't say too much about it but I think it's a very uh, overlooked piece of history and hopefully a very exciting one. Cool. Yeah, that's not a take I've really heard. Um, on you know when you when you when you think about the st- the, the movies and the stories of the bigger known activists, it's I, I you know there is a cost, and I don't necessarily think that's something that people really ever talk about. So. It's always kind of slightly brushed over, maybe yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, he was murdered, whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's, uh, yeah, we put a great team together for it. So we're, hopefully we can, yeah, hopefully people will like it when we start writing it. I'm sure they will. I'm confident. Oh, amazing. Well, you've got two people here who are interested. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Thank you so much for taking the time out to to speak with us today, David. Is there a website or something that people can find you on so they can, you know, stay in touch with the projects that you are working on, get some kind of inside information about the rig, anything like uh, that? I have, uh, so I have a website. Uh, I do really need to update it at some point. I wouldn't say it's the most professional website in the world. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's www.mcfurzone.com uh, I, don't, I don't even know .co.uk it must be but I think the best place to find me on is Twitter um, where uh, I post a lot of silly memes and gifts and that's my main mainstay but I'm at david underscore mac 13 uh, I do post some screenwriting content on, on there as well uh, but uh, that's the best time. That's the best place to find me, I think. Fantastic. Thank you again so much. Thank you, Julia, so much for taking the time out today to sit and talk with us and be my co-host on this podcast today. Um, David, I wish you the best of luck with the with the rig. Um, I can't wait to see it on Amazon when it comes out. There will be a watch party happening at my house. I will be calling Excellent. Family night for sure. So I'm very excited about this. And, you know, thank you all so much out there for listening and watching another episode of the St. Andrew Society of Los Angeles podcast. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. And we will see you guys next episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. For more information on the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, visit www.standrewsla.org. And don't forget to like our Facebook page, Instagram, and YouTube channels as well. Have a great week and we'll see you next episode.